Ready to go for one. Ready to go? Okay, I'll be there in just a second. We're out tonight with the Hotta, which lies between the English Constabulary and the SAS in English terms. They are a rapid response unit and they mean business. So when they say duck, you duck. And everyone, but everyone, has a bulletproof vest. In Northern Ireland, there were 3,000 murders in 30 years. Sao Paulo, Brazil's biggest city, achieved that figure in the first three months of this year. The police told me to sit away from the window for my own safety. I'd come to find out if the global economy, the promised cure-all in our super-fast wired world, is helping poor Brazilians climb out of poverty and violence, or making their lives an awful lot worse. There's always been violence in Sao Paulo, but never as bad as this. This year's murder rate is four times what it was in 1995. Homicide is the cause of death for two-thirds of the young men here. This 22-year-old man was arriving with a bullet in his leg. The shots had come from a passing car. 17 million people live in the city, half in slums, derelict buildings, or on the roadside. The latest UN figures measuring the gulf between rich and poor in each country in the world put Brazil 148th out of 150. A recent report for the Inter-American Bank solemnly concluded the more inequality, the more violence. This is the living proof. Every day it gets worse and worse. A catalogue of catastrophes, fatal shootings. It's really like a war here with the number of deaths, the number of incidents. I don't think you'd see this in any other country, in any other place. It really is a war here. A woman was brought in. She'd been shot in the chest. No one knew why. It was too late to save her. To this day, no one knows her name. A dead man was wheeled past us. Can you tell us just what happened? He told me three people had been attacked outside a restaurant. A woman shot in the leg, her brother, already dead, and her husband shot in the neck. Right now, they were finding out the extent of the husband's injuries. He was paralyzed from the neck down and will stay that way for the rest of his life. The violence is the most obvious sign that Sao Paulo, the economic powerhouse of Brazil, is in crisis. Globalization has trapped the poor in a vicious cycle of despair. Oi. Oi. Instead of wealth trickling down to their level, public spending has been cut across the board. They joke here that the best chance for the poor to get into hospital is to get shot. On an average weekend in Sao Paulo, there are 60, 70, 80 murders. Working here, you just have to accept that this is the situation in the country. Well, it might change. But with the mentality of this government, 
If people had more education, better standard of living, more money, more dignity, it might change. But that's not happening. It's been just about one hour since the first shotgun casualty came in the Saturday night with a bullet in his leg. Since then, there have been five people in, two dead on arrival, one paralyzed from the neck down. To the doctors and nurses working here, this is just a and other Saturday night. No big deal, no major shootings, no major events. It's just the way it is here, just the way it is. The police took me up above the smog that choked Sao Paulo. Ten years ago, Brazil opened to the big idea of our time. Stabilize your currency, trade and compete in the global market, and in the end, everyone will be better off. At first, the signs looked good. Foreign investment flooded in. Unemployment fell. Sao Paulo established itself as the financial center of Latin America, and Brazil looks set to become one of the economic superpowers of the new century. But something has gone very badly wrong. 55-year-old Jose Torres Eduardo is one of the millions of people globalization was meant to help. It hasn't, and now he has no hope that it will. He scratches a living selling paper and metal for recycling, all recovered from other people's rubbish. He's a carpenter by trade, but the burgeoning economy has done nothing for him. Soaring interest rates aimed at keeping the currency stable have helped international business, but sent local firms to the wall. Over 100,000 jobs have gone in Sao Paulo alone in the last couple of years. People like Jose remain at the bottom of the pile. Hello, <laughs> So how much did you get? Huh? Ten. 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 Uh, that's ten reals. So, so Jose, with ten reals, what can you get for today? What can you buy? Well, I could get some rice. A lot of the oil. Or oil or a dozen eggs, but everything is so expensive. So this isn't really a very good day's pay at all? No, it's not enough. Two million people in Brazil have 53% of the wealth. The internet and global market may do something for the up-and-coming middle class, but you can't fancy the chances of the remaining 54 million who live in poverty. Like Jose, more than one in ten of them can't read or write. A company wants three or four people, and they get 50, 60, maybe even 500 people going for the job. And of course, they'll take the guy who's more intelligent and better at reading and writing. Jose took me to where he lives. It was an abandoned tower block. Hi, can we come in? <laughs> While he returned to the streets, my translator Gudin and I went to visit Jose's children. It's a refuge from the violence, but hardly the way into the new global economy. There's no regular electricity, no phone lines, none of the tools for joining in. And, uh, it's cold. It's very, very cold for a Brazilian winter. So what's happening here? A pressure group tipped them off about the place, and they'd moved in three weeks ago. 150 families, they told us, share one hot tap and shower, powered by a single illegal wire. They're okay. making uh, beans for lunch already as well. Cooking and warmth comes from the fire. They just heard the police were about to evict them. The families were preparing barricades to fight for the little they had. We found Jose's 15-year-old daughter, Carla, collecting water. 
Unlike her father, she has attended school and can read and write. But she hasn't picked up the skills to make her employable in a modern economy. We followed Carla upstairs. We found her brother and sister in a small, dark, cold room. What's it like living here? It's a little bit difficult. It's okay to be getting on with. And one day my dad will bring some furniture. And then it will be better. Carla dreams of being a vet, but she's not a fool. She knows her chances of escape are slim. What do you want to achieve? What do you want to conquest? A home. A home. To have a home. It's not easy, is it? Where would you really like to be? I'd like to have a better home. Some money to buy things. We don't have money to buy anything. What I'd really want most is to have a family without rows and squabbles. With God's help, we can stay here and it'll be great. In the global economy, education's everything. Carla and her friends are better educated than their parents. But the education gap is like the poverty gap. The haves surge ahead faster than the have-nots. This factory is near one of the largest slums. It now produces a million bikes a year. They've even started to export to the UK. But to compete in the global marketplace, they've just slashed their workforce from 1,000 to 500. They're only making bikes, but people who might have been employable before are now not good enough. We are always uh, looking for uh, literate people. Okay, it's very important that they have a good uh, background because we are all investing in the in quality uh, area. So to do that, I, it's very important to have people that can uh, understand the, uh, the, the procedures of each area. In the neighboring slum, I met Father Eddie McGettrick, an Irish priest who's worked here for 25 years. He says his parishioners welcomed the idea of the global economy, but now hope has died. We knock on the houses around here. I can assure you the people are hungry. They're, they're ashamed to come out. And it's getting worse. And uh, because of the violence here, we often ask, what, what is the violence saying? And what do you think it's saying? I think it's saying that uh, they're tired mm -hmm. with the crumbs, taking the crumbs that are falling from the rich man's table. That they want, they want to, to share in that, as we say here in the roast chicken, that smell that's coming beautifully. 
If children here are ever to benefit from the global market, they need better education. But better education means more public spending, which is just what foreign investors don't want to see. To give them comfort, the government tried to peg the real to the dollar. It didn't work. The speculators hit the currency, and now 20% of government revenue has to go into repayment of debt. For Father Eddie, it's the latest example of the poor bearing the cost of a mad world. For us here at the bottom, it's survival of the fittest. Because all this the educational system has broken down, the health system has broken down. And if the people on top can't hear our cry, they're going to hear our voice from the violence. There's a backlash against all this that is growing by the day. During my visit, there was a national day of protest. Again and again, people shouted slogans calling for more money for schools, more money for hospitals. Once, the hope of doing better drew people from the countryside into the cities. It's a measure of how desperate and violent things are becoming in Sao Paulo that now people want to go the other way, back into the countryside. After the tensions of the city, I was ready to leave. Not only were there violent demonstrations all around the country, but two demonstrators died, one shot by the police, the other shot by gunmen. So is moving to the country the answer then? Well, that's what I'm off to discover. I was going to meet members of the Landless Workers Movement, the MST. They've turned their backs on the 21st century and retreated to the 19th. The group aggressively targets land for occupation. The trouble is, the land belongs to someone else. When we arrived, they were celebrating mass. Once, most Brazilians lived like this, growing just enough to survive. Now, much of the land is taken up by vast cash crops for global sales. These people find themselves scrabbling for existence on the edges. In the city, you've got no hope. Most of these people will never get a job. And the big thing in the 20th century, industrialization, meant mechanization, automation. It's thrown millions of people into the dustbin. So when we go back to the land, we're also looking for a reason for living. Industrialization and globalization have disregarded the purpose of human life. They need more land. Their desperation makes them ruthless. It means that farms like this one, just five minutes from where the MST is based, are vulnerable. This is the farm of a landowner called Luis Antonio, who was the victim, if you call it that, of an occupation about a month ago. Uh, he would say his land was invaded. And I thought that would be a good idea to go and speak to him and get his take on it. At 6.30 one morning, the group turned up on his doorstep. They said they were taking over his farm. Then I saw that somebody was there with a, with a rifle. Right. Because of, I saw the, the barrel, you know. Then suddenly they start to, to, to scream, 
We are a landless movement uh, and I want to get in your home because we invaded your home and your land. Right. We want to go in. I said, no. They said, if you don't, don't open, we will broke all the, all the doors and windows. Then they started. Really? Ten windows and uh, four doors, you know. Ten One. windows and four doors, they yes. broke them? Yes, from the kitchen and uh, from here up to this door. Right. And then one guy, the leader, and point a pistol to me. He pointed a pistol? Yes, and told me, uh, open the door, open the door and say a lot of, and said a lot of bad words. Right. I said, stay calm, I'm, I'm not armed, I'm uh, free, you can see, I will open the door. Uh -huh. Then I opened the door, he took me and uh, threw me to, the, to the, the floor and pointed the pistol. Louise and Dalva were forced to leave. By the time they were able to return to their farmhouse, 12 hours later, the police had arrested 13 of the trespassers and 11 were jailed. No gun was ever found. But Louise now fears Brazil is heading towards chaos. If they want land, they have to ask somebody to the government not to invade and take out our land, you know? Why my land or our land? It is a small one. It's for us to, to grow some, something here, you know? Right. It's not a socialism here. But the landless workers believe it is. Returning to the land to eke out an existence is now their best hope of surviving the yawning gap that is opening up between the rich and poor in the 21st century. And in this battle, they feel justified in doing whatever it takes. Will you try to occupy Luis Antonio's land again? Absolutely. We'll occupy not only his land, but any other farm in the Vale of Paraíba that's lying idle. I went with them to visit the 11 who'd been arrested at Luis Antonio's farm. Jesse was here to see Luciano, his 19-year-old son. Manuelita, his girlfriend, has come too. The teenagers in the group see themselves as prisoners of conscience, soldiers in the war against globalization. They will be tried and could face eight years in prison. I get so emotional, I can't stand it. You were there. Seeing a son in prison is very difficult. He says that inside it's okay, but I can see in his eyes that it's not. It's very crowded. There are prisoners there for other reasons together with him. The police do what they want. Back in the city, at a cemetery by a slum, a young man was being buried, shot only the night before. 22-year-old Wallace Pereira was shot by the police. It's not unusual. The number of people killed by them increased by 60% last year. The police say he was robbing a petrol station, but his family don't believe it. Wallace may have been innocent, but no one will ever know. Instead, he has become another statistic in this year's epidemic of despair. 70% of people buried here are aged between 15 and 25. He's not the first and he won't be the last. We're very frightened of being robbed at gunpoint, of being murdered, and we're frightened of our children getting involved with these people. We've no security, and that's what it's like in our country today. 
the global experiment in Brazil is balanced on a knife edge. Its supporters argue that with time, better education and continuing foreign investment, the experiment will work. But time is running out. For now, the pressures of being in the global marketplace are tearing the society apart. Cyrus Shah travels to the heart of a sleeping sickness epidemic in southern Sudan. It's just the kind of ancient disease that the modern global village we're all supposed to live in nowadays ought to be able to wipe out without any problem at all. So why is the only treatment an injection that kills one in 20 patients? And why have the pharmaceutical companies stopped making the modern drug that cures the disease? Unreported World, next Friday on 4.